So, welcome to the 57th Hands on Agile Meetup. Um, today, uh, I'm very proud uh, that uh, Martin Dahlman is joining us. Um, he's the author of the fabulous uh, book on sprint goals. So, one of the books you really need to have in your library if you um, consider to be uh, an agile peer and if you can want to take this all seriously um, because it's uh, offering such a interesting perspective, the background, and it really helps you to embrace this idea of value creation from from a different and significantly uh, higher level of perspective. So I highly recommend it. And um, he has prepared a few things for us, and um, we will be able to have a short uh, Q&A session uh, at the end. So uh, I would say, uh, if you're good to go, let's get started. Martin, stage is yours. Here's a go. I just turned me on my stopwatch. Does everybody see my screen? Went quick. Yes. Does everybody see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So tonight I'm going to talk about a topic that's very dear to me. It's closely related to sprint goals. And hopefully by the end, you will also understand why it's closely related. Humble planning. How do you make humble plans? Why, why do they even matter? And how do you make plans that suck less? And um, to do that, I will be actually be talking about oops, some of these undisputed masters, these, these companies like Pixar that produce blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster, or companies like Nintendo that produce these great games that break records all over the world, and Valve, which is another gaming company, what can we learn from their approach to planning? How do they do planning? And maybe let's start by talking about Pixar. So Pixar has made a lot of movies. How many Oscars do you think they've won? They've, they've, they, I think they've made like 30 movies. So just write in the chat, think about it. How many Oscars did Pixar win? So I love Pixar movies, right? They've made many great movies. It's very difficult to pick a best one. And what is very interesting is they have won a lot of Oscars. They've won 23 Oscars to be precise, which is an insane amount, right? And I cheated a little bit. It includes their short movies too. So, uh, but they've won a crazy amount of Oscar, uh, Oscars. So you might be thinking they know what they're doing. They have a recipe for success. And if you think that, right, despite all the messages on LinkedIn, where they actually tell you the storytelling secrets of Pixar, it's all a lie <laughs> because there is no recipe for success. And this is actually from Ed Cutmull. He's the co-founder of Pixar. And he actually wrote the following. Early on, all of our movies suck. Our job is to make them from suck to not suck. So all of them are bad. They don't have a recipe. And maybe let's just tell some... So it's going to the wrong direction. I hope oh, I learned something new. Um... So let's talk about Toy Story. That's a really good example. So Toy Story is the first movie Pixar made. Um, and they presented the movie at the storyboard review. So that's the moment when you have like the storyboard with the whole movie and everybody hated it. And they hated Woody, which is the Indian, like they, the, sorry, the, the World West character. And they halted the whole development of the movie. And Disney said, this movie is so bad, you have to rewrite the whole script. And then you're thinking, yeah, Maarten, but this was the first Toy Story movie. Come on, like, uh, okay. So then you go to Up, which I think is one of the best ones they made, like one of the better ones at least. And when they were making that movie, the initial story, the initial pitch was about a castle floating in the sky with a king with two sons who hated each other. So if you've ever seen the movie, or even if you look at the picture, that's not a king, that's an old man, right? An old man with a little boy who is not his son. And they ch totally changed the movie because they were not able to make the initial story work. During the making of the movie, they discovered a different story and they were able to make that one work. And then you might be thinking, yeah, Martin, but this is this is movie. So now let's go a little bit closer to software development. So this is gaming, this is GoldenEye 007. So if, uh, I, I don't know if anyone in the audience have ever played this game, but this is one of the best games ever made. And what's very interesting is this game was delayed by six months. And 
uh, I vividly remember as a child people telling me about this game because you could play with four people against each other. I was in gym class. That's how much of an impression it left on me. But what, what people don't know is that multiplayer was added in the final month of development while the game was delayed because the developers were kind of playing around and found it so fun that they're actually like, this has to be in the game. And uh, yeah, it was added without the knowledge of management because they said, we're not going to tell management because then they are really going to tell us, you're not allowed to do it. Uh, <laughs> so without that, that game wouldn't have been as good. Another example from gaming, Half-Life. This is also one of the best games ever made. That game was not delayed once, not twice, but three times. And they were able to delay this game because uh, actually while creating the game, they did a lot of playtesting. So they had playtesters and they, the playtesters were telling them this game is not fun. And they knew they had fun mechanics in there. So they actually made a level with all the cool game mechanics and then they rewrote the whole game until it was fun. And uh, yeah, so... And Valve has made many great games. You might not know them, but these are all like uh, in the list of the best uh, uh, games of all time. Like all of them are delayed and they make fun of it. They call it Valve time. It's done when it's done. And they're also working on Half-Life 3 for, I don't know, 20 years or 15 years, but nobody knows. So yeah. Um, and if you read the book, Blood, Bloods and Pixels, every game is delayed at least once. Like it's not unique to these games. Like every game is delayed because it has to be fun and it, and you cannot plan it up front. You discover that while making the game. You and So now to the realm of software development where I actually have a lot of experience. I don't have experience as gaming. So for some reason I'm cursed. I, I'm always involved in rebuilds. I've been involved in seven rebuilds, which is a crazy amount. How many of these rebuilds do you think were delivered on time? So please write in the chat. I, I'm sure some of you wrote zero. Well, that's the correct answer. Like I've delivered zero on time. And why is that? That's because before starting, you simply don't know enough. And yeah, so what can we learn from all of this, right? Our initial plans often suck. Like with Pixar, the initial plans suck. And games, the initial plans suck. The same goes for re rebuilding software products. If you build something big, the plans are not going to be great. And then even if everything goes according to the plan, like with the first Pixar movie or the Half-Life game, which was initially delivered on time, it still doesn't mean the result is going to be great. And then unless you have a really good feedback mechanism, way of telling you, hey, this movie is good, like Pixar has, right? So, and then tell that the Pixar has a brain trust. So they actually review all the movies uh, every month. They review this and they give feedback to the director. And then the director can choose to make adjustments, yes or not. Half-Life, they do playtesting. So they actually play the game and they get feedback from the playtesters. So they have a really good feedback mechanism and that's what matters, not whether they deliver on time. But this is actually kind of the opposite that we see in most companies. So this is actually my experience working at, especially at bigger companies. I call it the planning cycle of madness. So let's say you're working at a big company and you produce a roadmap with features and timelines and you fail to deliver on that roadmap. And then management gets angry, right? The plans are bad. You need to do a better job of planning. And then everybody gets all excited. Like we need to, we need to step up and we more meetings, more planning, more analysis. We're going to do a better job. And then we overfit our plans by injecting noise and speculation. And the plans come disconnected from reality and rooted in our imagination. And then our plans actually become an anchor that stifle the, stifles the ability to collaborate and adapt. And then we are dragged down by our plans. And then we fail to meet our plans and roadmap. And management gets angry again. And I kid you not, I've seen this happen 10 times at the same company. And I try to explain it to them. And it goes over and over. That's why I call it the planning cycle of madness. So if you want to break this cycle, so this is a really important concept. I think every agilist should understand the concept of friction. And it's actually hundreds of years old. It's from a German general, von Clausewitz. And actually he used this concept to explain what makes war warfare difficult. I want to stress, I don't want to glorify war, but that's where a lot of the complex challenges first happen. It's like, how do you make plans when everything changes? And he basically said in warfare, Everything is very simple, but the simplest thing even become difficult because people are stressed. They're fighting for their lives. There might be a bit of mud. So the, the cavalry arrives late. There might be some fog. So you don't see the enemy. So you cannot aim your cannons. And that's the force that makes the easy difficult. And it's the difference between a war on, in theory and war in practice. Okay. Still sounds a bit abstract, right? So now let's make it very simple. Uh, so 
if what you're doing is clear, which means there is absolutely no friction, it's kind of like this picture here. You see the stairs, you see all the steps, you see the beginning, you see the end. Just follow the steps and life is going to be great. Everything is clear. You don't have a fog of beforehand, which means before starting, you can see everything. There's no fog of speculation in the sense that uh, when you make plans, everything pans out expected. You cannot over plan or overthink. Life is just swell. Now, let's say you introduce a little bit of friction, right? So this is what you're doing is complicated. So this is actually my life. So I have an espresso machine at home, like a fancy one, which was a big mistake, actually. I love the espresso, but the mistake I made is I'm the only one that knows how to use it. <laughs> so it's kind of like making espresso right, with a fancy machine. If you're an expert, you know all the steps. I can tell someone else exactly how to do it. Uh, there's just a recipe you have to follow. But if you don't have expertise, then there will be a follow-up beforehand. You don't know before making the espresso or the cappuccino, you don't know exactly what you have to do. And um, if you lack expertise, then you're going to make all kinds of wrong assumptions and the coffee is going to taste terrible. Now, let's say what you're doing is complex. And I think the best example is the movie Jaws. So when they when Spielberg made the movie Jaws, he was an expert filmmaker. He was he was not world famous, but he was a really really gifted filmmaker. He really knew his stuff because I mean he made a lot of movies already and also directed a lot of TV series. And during filming, the, sh the mechanical shark broke down, so they couldn't film the shark. Other problem is he wanted to make a movie at sea with natural daylight. Well, that's really really difficult because every shot, the lighting is a little bit different. You cannot connect them. So long story short, the movie was triple over budget, three times delayed. And yeah, um, the actors, they actually had to rewrite the script because the shark didn't work. So now the movie is very famous because he rewrote the script. So you don't see the shark, you just see the fin and the music or the presence of something happening. And uh, yeah, so in short, every step you take helps shape the way. Expertise matters, but it still isn't enough. So during filming, the actor got the script one day before filming. He was improvising because he discovered, he had many surprises caused by friction. So even with expertise, you're going to have the fog of beforehand. You don't know everything before starting. And yeah, if you overthink things, you may inject the fog of speculation and your plans and actions won't produce the desired results. So in short, it's kind of like this. The more friction, the more surprises. And the more surprises, the lower your predictability and ability to make strong plans. So in short, the more your plans have to change. And on the left-hand side, let's say you have limited friction or friction you can deal with with sufficient expertise, like with my espresso example, then plan-driven uh, approaches work perfectly well. You can give someone the plan, you can give them the recipe, they can do a great job, assuming they have expertise. But on the right-hand side, it's not enough. You need to have a goal and you need to adjust your plans based on that goal. And that goal has to be explicit. It cannot be part of the plan because the plan is going to fill. And then when the plan fills, they cannot anchor themselves to the plan. And that's why you must have a goal for dealing with friction. In short, in the plan we trust, that's when you have limited or no friction. And when your goal driven approaches, which means you trust the results, you definitely don't trust the plan. <laughs> To visualize in another way, if what you're doing is complex, which I believe most software development is, there are many things you don't know and you will you can expect many surprises. And our default approach, which we also do when it's complicated, is to spend more time planning, but then you inject your plans with speculation and noise and all these false assumptions or things you cannot know before starting, which I call the fog of beforehand. And then you have too much planning and your plans become disconnected from uh, reality, they're rooted in your imagination. What we should be doing instead is, is what I call humble planning. Every step you take helps shape the way the plan emerges as you do the work. It's not plan uh, less, it's plan more later. When you know more, when you have a better understanding of the situation, and then you shrink what you don't know, instead of adding this fog of speculation and injecting noise in your plans. And this is why my talk is called how to make your plans suck less. Because if what you're doing is complicated and you don't spend enough time planning, your plans are going to suck. 
But if you do spend a lot of time planning with the right expertise, you can have plans that rock, that really kick ass. But if what you're doing is complex, you follow exactly the same approach, you're setting yourselves up for failure. Because, yeah, so all that big room planning, what many teams do, what you're doing is complex, you're really making plans for many months. You're only making them worse. And you might be thinking now, Martha, yeah, I kind of know that already. I understand complex work. Yeah, but I can tell you one thing. It's super easy to take the wrong approach, even if you know these things. And uh, I can tell you my book, right? I, I want to stress, I don't know if writing a book is complex or complicated, but for me, it was complex. <laughs> um, but how many of these three timelines do you all think I've hit? So... Basically, when you sign a contract, you need to give the timelines. Stefan did the same. And you uh, basically, what they also put in there, and I don't know, Stefan, if you read that, but it basically says, if you're late, they can hire a ghostwriter to finish your book and pay it out of your royalties. <laughs> yeah, I know there's that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how many do you think I, I hit? And I was basically super nervous because I was like, I'm screwed. They're going to hire a ghostwriter. <laughs> to finish my book, which I really didn't want. Not because of the money, because it's my book. <laughs> so how do you mean? Please write in the chat. The only timeline I hit was the first timeline. And you want to know why I hit the first timeline? Because it was finished before I signed the contract. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason. So this is overconfident planning. So actually, th the reason why I did this overconfident planning, uh, it, actually what I did, I didn't tell that, forgot to tell that. So I actually wrote one weekend, like 20%. I'd been writing for many years, one article per week. So in one week I wrote like, uh, sorry, one weekend I wrote like 80 pages. And I was like, six months, I can easily do that. You know, like no problem. <laughs> yeah, and you, you can see how right I was. Uh, so it's very easy to fall in this trap where you think like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, but you don't. So how do we fix this, right? So I already talked about it. You start with humble plans. Every step you take helps shape the way. You plan more later when you know more. And you have to lead with the context. So you need to stay anchored in the results by starting with intent. So intent is you basically tell people, hey, this is the relevant context and this is what we're trying to achieve. Because when the plan doesn't work and you have surprises, then they have sufficient context to change the plan. And this is actually from the military. This is what the they, they nowadays, nowadays do. Also in Ukraine, like every mission has a commander's intent. So it basically tells the people that are on the battleground, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is why it, why it matters, so that they can change the plans. And this is the real world example from D-Day, which you might know from Saving Private Ryan's actually secure. I'm hearing you, Charles. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, to secure key bridges, road junctions, and other locations in Normandy. That's what they were trying to achieve. So that they could allow the ground invasion, invasion forces to advance and land. And this exact same idea, that's your sprint call. Like, during the sprint, people should know, what are we trying to achieve? What is our mission? And why does it matter? What's the relevant context? Because when they execute the plan, and their surprises, or stuff is more difficult, or it needs to be solved in a different way, then they actually don't have to talk to the product owner because they can actually immediately decide because you want them to make decisions in the moment. And that's also what they want in the army because you want to have the people that have the best information, the best inform understanding of the situation, be able to immediately make the right decision without waiting for orders, without waiting for people to tell them what to do. They can tell themselves what they have to do because they have a clear goal. So how do you do that, right? I mean, I wrote a whole book, so I cannot dis dis the, uh, explain everything in, in a short time, but this is a, maybe a very handy acronym, which I always use. So first of all, when you set a sprint goal, come up with a title, because if it's a, how do you say, something that you're trying to achieve, it's pro uh, it's difficult to remember, but if you have like an, a handy mnemonic, uh, a one-liner, that it makes it easy to remember, and preferably something fun, but at least make it memorable so that people will remember it. Focus it on the outcome. Like, what are you trying to achieve? Make the sprint call together because then there's common understanding. If you write it down, then you have a document. You don't have a uh, common understanding. Ultimate, so why are we doing this? A singular one thing, not two or three things. Because the moment you have two or three things, then uh, they will come, yeah, what, what do we do now? We're trying to do three things. <laughs> we cannot do all three. And that's why we need to have one. 
I also want to stress, I talked a little about friction. Friction is a really important concept. If you understand it well, then you actually don't need to talk about the Agile Manifesto because the Agile Manifesto is actually all about how do you deal with friction. Individual, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, that's actually about, hey, we're following a process, overdoing the right thing in the moment, which is a bad way of dealing with friction. Uh, trying to write all this documentation while reality is different, like the working software, also friction. So if you understand friction really well and the ineffective responses to friction, then that's what the Agile Manifesto is about too. And I think it's what, what the Agile Manifesto doesn't do really well, in my opinion, is explaining why it's necessary. And that's why if you understand friction, then you understand the why. And yeah, that's why I always say like Agile eh, should feel like playing jazz. Like you're you're walking a tightrope in a swirling wind, stuff is happening. You need to deal with it in a moment. You navigate the uncertainty with skill, responding to the changing conditions and finding equilibrium in the unexpected, which you cannot predict. You cannot predict the wins. And then hopefully you do something really nice, a breathtaking performance. Very often doesn't happen, except if you're Pixar. And then life is great. <laughs> um, and that's the other thing I would really would like to stress. I think there is not a fo not focus on these goals, right? Like, I if I read, for example, uh, Slack channels, I see a lot of these kind of questions. Who should the Scrum Master report to? Or how do you handle dependencies in Scrum? How do you do estimation in Scrum? And I want to stress, Scrum is purposefully incomplete. So even if you do it perfectly, it's still perfectly incomplete. And then I'm not saying that the process doesn't matter, but I really think there needs to be more emphasis in the beauty on the results. Because in the end, Scrum is a framework that's supposed to help you deliver results. And that's where we really need to pay more attention to, not whether we're perfectly doing everything uh, by the book. Because the most important thing is, are we delivering results? And yeah, I talked about humble planning. I think it also really relates to scaling issues. So if we talk about scaling issues, uh, if you introduce a scaling framework, you usually have three problems. You didn't fix your original issues. You added new complexity, which makes it harder to troubleshoot the original issues. And your scaling framework introduces new problems you didn't have before. It's the same thing as the overconfident planning. And why is it so important as well when you're scaling? Because complex systems evolve from systems, are usually evolved from simple systems that work. I've worked at startups, right? It starts with something simple, it becomes complex over time. And then what generally happens with rebuilds, where the, the worst mistakes happen is because they know they have a complex system, they design a complex system from scratch. And then this complex system has its own behavior that they, it didn't, they didn't anticipate. And sometimes you can have huge problems. And that's why you should start over with a simple system and evolve it gradually, because if we can predict it everything perfectly, then it's not a complex system. And that's why also when you're scaling, do humble scaling, scale as you solve problems, don't scale to solve problems. And uh, I think a really good thing to do is starting with humble plans, do this function mapping, which by Michael Lloyd, like map your dysfunctions, and then use the patterns and anti-patterns, like Stefan has a really beautiful book coming up to resolve your problems. And then you have something that really works instead of uh, copy-pasting this bundle of solutions that may or may or not work in your context. In short, I know I've talked about many things, but if you remember one thing, the more we try to prevent sucking at predicting, the more we will guarantee to suck at adapting. I think it's a very deep quote, but, uh, and yeah, and I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to ask, yeah, but Marta, people ask for precise timelines and budgets. We have to provide numbers, make shit up. That's what you're doing anyhow. Like the only difference is don't screw up your plans to make these made up numbers, right? And if you really want to provide the best numbers, then you should actually look at similar projects that others have done and add some padding that's way more reliable than whatever you do, uh, uh, yeah refining work and then estimating it. And yeah, don't introduce all these big bang scaling frameworks, gradually fix your problems. Thank you very much. I'm very curious for all of your questions. Awesome. That was awesome. Okay. Let me switch back into the gallery mode. Now, um, 
you all have the uh, link for the parking lot, I would say that give it two minutes or so. And if you have a few questions, please uh, put them there. And then we start uh, working on the Q&A yeah. part. Ah, good one. How would you define friction? Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. I, that's one I fortunately can answer. Yeah. Wow, that's always good. <laughs> um, please, please uh, remind, uh, let me remind you of the fact that in physics, friction is not bad. You know, without friction, we wouldn't be moving. <laughs> <laughs> um, a bit of friction uh, Yeah, is okay. there is a Kindle version. Uh, I see someone writing it. Okay. Good. Well, shall we get going with the first one? So, in a team with multiple different products within a sprint, it seems impossible to articulate a sprint goal, let alone a unifying sprint goal. What would you recommend? Shortening yeah. sprints to days? Yeah. Ah. So, I'm going to answer, but Stefan, I'm sure you also have some stuff to add. I'm also curious, like, so, so here's the main thing, right? If you cannot sit, set a single sprint goal, then that's usually a symptom of other problems. For example, working on too many different products at the same time is a symptom. And I can tell you one thing, which I've I've also been in those situations, is if you're working with one team on four or five products, then it's very hard to work as a team because you're working on four or five products. So it mean, probably means one, of, one is working on one product. And not, I've been there, like I was a product owner for integrations. So that is your 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 situation. And I don't think sprint goals will fix that situation because you cannot force them to work if you have to work on five things at the same time. But I would say, having been there as a product owner for integrations, that is your problem. Like for me, a, a team is a group of people working towards a common goal. And if you have a team working on five things, there's not really a good common goal. And I also don't think Scrum is the best thing because you're not really a team, so you're going to have a daily scrum where one person talks about product A, another person about product B, another one about product C. Uh, yeah, they're not going to all going to be interested in that. So yeah, th this is based on my personal experience. So um, whoever asked that question can, of course, also respond because I don't have the full context and maybe I'm missing something. But that's my, uh, these are my thoughts. Hey, what's the next one? Oops. No, oh. if the time foreseen for the rebuild of products was originally much longer, would they have to be delivered on time? I'm not sure I understand the question. So I also saw there was another question. So, but maybe it's good to ask for clarification because mm. if the question is, if the timeline would have been longer uh, and uh, how do you say it would have been longer than it took, would we then have delivered on time? Probably yes. <laughs> But I don't think that's the question. Um, I've, I, there's been some research done that actually the best way of estimating is actually if you really look at similar projects, which is hard, right? I mean, in software development, and you add a certain amount of padding, and because then it's actually these these estimates are real-world estimates rooted in all the stuff you didn't know before starting. And because it's a similar project, you're actually estimating similar you know, degree of uncertainty, stuff you didn't do, know, so, and then you deliver on time. But I think the fundamental problem is, this is maybe the, the easiest way to explain it is, let's say I give you, I show you a jar of pennies, right? And I make a picture of the jar of pennies and you only see the picture. You see one side of the jar and I ask you, how many pennies are in there? Well, good luck. You can estimate, you could be right, you could be wrong. And I really feel that's the same thing when you're doing complex work. You just don't have enough information before you start. So, uh, yeah. I, I think, of course, you can deliver on time, right? You can get lucky, so to speak. Just as like when I ask you, hey, how many jars are in, how many pennies are in this jar? You could give the perfect answer, but yeah, you don't have the information. <laughs> that's that's what I believe. Thank you. Okay, next question. A lot of advice around Sprint Gold mentions making it specific and measurable, smart. Yeah. Uh, but not all Sprint Golds can be measured. So how would you approach this? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. So I think one thing I didn't talk about, uh, which I obviously talk about in my book is, um, so when you deliver something, that's an output, right? it's something you do, but the outcomes, they are usually lagging. And for example, sometimes even an e-commerce running an EB test can take months depending on your traffic. So 
the key thing I'm trying to say here is you need to formulate your sprint goals in such a way that people understand what we're trying to achieve. And what we're trying to achieve is, first of all, that output, you know, that there's something you deliver, but second of all, that outcome. And there is a link between the two because those that output is supposed to drive that outcome. And another important uh, conclusion from this is at the sprint review, you need to discuss old features from many sprints ago because those lagging outcomes can take a long time. So you need to be able to talk about them. So smart sprint goals, yeah, I mean, it's a start, right? But it's not enough because nobody, I formulated smart sprint goals. Nobody talks about them because you get a goal like increase conversion by 15% because blah, blah, blah. Nobody's going to talk about that. But if you have like a fun, fun title for it, like, I don't know, uh, show me the money or whatever, people will remember it and then they will drop it in conversation. And then, yeah, it's still smart and it still matters. But I think the other things I mentioned are even more important. Hey, next one. What do you suggest when product plans are tightly tied to the annual financial planning cycle in the company? Um, how do you acquire or forecast the dollars needed from leadership? Yeah. So that's the thing, right? Like, so what do we currently do? That's the planning cycle of madness. Like we make up stuff and we're wrong. So I think the main thing, which I think is really difficult and it's maybe not going to be a satisfying answer. I've actually been in situations where a business case was made and a feature was prioritized and it was expected to bring in millions and it was prioritized. We worked on it for months and it actually, in the end, it delivered probably $5,000. This is a real world example. And that's the hard part. Like, like I think uh, doing, tying your planning and your budget in that way doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do the most valuable things because the best business case wins, wins which is a paper victory. Uh, yeah. So if you need to make numbers up, make them up. But Make sure that your plans have some flexibility to discover and to do stuff because it's more important to uh, respond to what's happening and what you learn than to deliver what's promised because you made a plan. Hey, the next one, a very practical question. Have you often made up stuff regarding timelines? And if so, how did it go? <laughs> so here's a fun story. So uh, actually, um, the the two product rebuilds that were the most accurate were the ones where we actually didn't involve the developers in the estimation. <laughs> well, not, I mean, we did, of course, involve them in the ultimate forecast, but the reason is that we just, uh, me and the CTO sat together, we just made some stuff up and we really made it crazy. Uh, how do you say, uh, reason, uh, how do you, a lot of padding, like, and yeah. Uh, and then we showed it to the team, like, hey, we could do this with you. And then you need to break everything down, sit in a meeting room for many days. You want that? No. Like, so this is what we want to present. <laughs> Do you think it's reasonable? Yeah, we can easily make it, which they didn't make. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I've done that. And uh, yeah, I, you don't get a really uh, a better answer or worse answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what if your humble plans become over budget? Any suggestions, consider the question line six also. That yeah. was, um, ah, the rebuild stuff. Okay. Um, because sometimes your timeline shapes uh, is shaped by your budget. Yeah, correct. So here's what I, I think most people do and which I believe you shouldn't do, right? So imagine you have a timeline you have to meet. Then what they do is they put everything, everyone in the meeting room and they actually break everything down, estimate everything. And that's the plan and that's the timeline. And uh, what I think work, works far better is what is the smallest thing you can build that's a step towards what you're trying to achieve and how can you deliver that as quickly as possible and, and working on that. So really doing something uh, which removes, uh, and, and especially if you're, you're have like a, uh, how do you say something risky, uh, removes the most risk and uncertainty and really push the team to say, hey, I want to, we, let, what can we do in one month? You know, like uh, what's the smallest thing? Um, that provides so much more information. And even if you throw it away, which I've done, like uh, uh, um, then you're, you're usually still faster than if you do the other approach, which is, breaking everything down, estimating it and being wrong. Okay. 
my favorite question, how do you define friction? How do you find friction? So the way I would define friction is uh, the more friction, the more surprises. So if, you're, if what you're doing is you're faced with friction, the more surprises you're going to have. And surprises basically is uh, new information. It's like related to, uh, how can I say, the definition of uh, Cloud Shannon, like uh, entropy. So the more surprise something, something contains, the more information it has. And uh, yeah, so... More friction, more surprises. Now, a very practical question. Uh, will there be concrete examples in the book? Good yes, there bad. will be concrete examples in the book. <laughs> how to make humble business plans. Well, that's a fun one. Okay. How to make humble business plans. I think the best example I've read is on the book Delivering Happiness from Tony. Uh, I cannot pronounce his last name, but I will write it. Tony... That's how you write his name, I believe. Could be wrong. Uh, he sadly passed away um, a few years back. He's the founder of Zappos. And what he actually did is, so Zappos was the first online shoe retailer. And Tony was an entrepreneur since a young age, selling, I think, worms and buttons. It's all told in the book. <laughs> But anyhow, um, you might be thinking, hey, I want to sell shoes online. So I start with an e-commerce web show and all these things. He didn't do that. So actually what he did is actually he started with a WordPress website and he started with an email address and he just, uh, people could email an Excel sheet. Like uh, they could, sorry, download an Excel sheet with all the shoes. Then they would actually send the Excel sheet back with which shoes they wanted. And someone would go to a, a real store, <laughs> buy the shoes, ship them to them. And that was how he started. So very low tech. And his, I think the important realization is if you're solving a real problem or a real need, people don't mind that it sucks because they, they really want it. And as sucky as the experience was, like, yeah, that's how he started. And that's how he discovered, okay, there is a business here and uh, without any big investments. And then you have information and then you can make a business plan instead of making way too many assumptions. Hey, next one. Uh, could you elaborate on scaling by humble plans, dysfunction yep. mapping and patterns? Yeah, I know. It was a lot in one slide. So dysfunction mapping, you can Google on it. It's by Michael Lloyd. I think it's a really nice technique. And basically um, uh, what, he, what it does is you make a map of... Well, let me take one step back. If you look at your team, your team is part of a system. And, and that system is the organization and also the team itself is part of that system. And that system produces certain symptoms, sort of stuff that doesn't go as well as expected. And by understanding all those symptoms, you can relate them to dysfunction, stuff you're not doing or stuff that's going wrong. For example, you're not using sprint goals. Um, and then when you have that information, you kind of have like a map of all the, all the stuff you can improve in your system by, for example, introducing sprint goals. And um, uh, so Stefan has written a lovely book about anti-patterns. So all those anti-patterns, basically, they, they can be part of your dysfunction map. And then if you know the anti-patterns, you can see, hey, what can we do to fix them? And uh, because you start with a dysfunction map with all these symptoms, which you will address or anti-patterns as well, one by one, you have humble plans. You're not like saying, hey, let's do less with five new things or like, you know, like you're not introducing all these new things at once. You're just fixing those problems. And in the meantime, you're evolving your way of working and your system. So yeah, I hope it makes sense. And otherwise ask questions. Um, speaking of the function mapping, just a short uh, yep. um, um, notice here. Um, Michael Lloyd will join us on January 10th next year. Oh, nice. And, I didn't know uh, that. Explain how it works. Yeah. yeah. That's it. So he will do a better job than me. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, how do you recommend mitigating risks and blockers that come up in the sprint, uh, which affect the sprint goal? Yeah. So that's a good one. So I think the beauty of a, a sprint goal is that, so first of all, not everything in your sprint has to relate to the sprint goal. So that's a very big misconception, right? You set a sprint goal and then you only pull in related work. So 
Because if you have blockers or risks which make things more complicated, you immediately have wiggle room. Because everything that doesn't rela relate to the sprint goal, you know, it's not as important. That's the decision you've made. The other thing is, um, I, uh, this is a real world example. I actually once started a sprint where we actually didn't know if what we were trying to do was possible. Like I was joining a new team. We had no clue how the systems worked, like what we needed, but we had a very clear goal. And yeah, so basically what I told them as a product owner is there, there are like uh, two ways this is going to pan out. Either we start working on this during the sprints and then uh, we don't deliver anything because we discover a risk or a blocker that we cannot overcome. Or maybe we might deliver something. And um, I told them if we don't deliver anything, then I will take responsibility and explain to the stakeholders. But the alternative is, which you often see at teams, is that you're not going to be working on the most valuable thing. You're going to do spikes. You're going to be talking about for weeks. And then you start working on it. And then you still discover blockers because you missed something. You know what I mean? So... Yeah, um, I think we need to be more like that's psychological safety, in my opinion. It's okay to encounter blockers, risks, and discover stuff because it's okay if stuff takes longer. Because the alternative is that we delay it, we refine it over and over again, and then cost of delay kicks in, and you will probably lose even more money because what you're doing should be way more valuable than the cost of your team. Because anyhow, otherwise you already have a much bigger problem. Absolutely. So next one. Um, if you have a team that is used to measuring outputs, what is the best way to get them to switch to measuring outcomes instead? Yeah. So there's this exercise I often do in workshops and uh, I will talk a little bit about it um, because I think it's a really simple exercise. Um, so I, I, I ask people to think about in pairs, like one person listens, one talks, what is the last purchase you did and why did you make that purchase, right? And then people start telling all these stories like, I bought a washing machine because blah, 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 you know? And um, uh, and then, of course, then the experts ask them, okay, so they switch. Uh, and then I ask them in the end, what does delivering value mean, right? And it, and it turns out that valuable is uh, sorry, value is something very personal. Like some people want a Porsche, some people want a Ferrari. It's all, uh, sorry, want a Lada. Like it, it's the same, it's all a car. It does the same thing. And uh, they don't talk about money, which is interesting. And then I asked them, okay, so how much time do you spend talking about uh, uh, business value versus customer value in your company? And in companies, they always talk about business value and they always talk about uh, money and business cases. But the important realization from this exercise is it starts with value creation, like so making something possible in someone's life, making them sleep better. And that's something that doesn't fit in this business case. That's something uh, in, very intangible and, and that's an outcome. And, and yeah, so that's what I do. And I, I think it's really eye-opening. I hope I explained it well in a short amount of time. Okay, ne next one. How to deal with teams that want a long-term plan, um, how to deal with the psychology. Yeah, yeah. So um, in the, the presentation, you saw that I, 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 one thing I try to do with my book is introduce these concepts using easy to relate stories um, so that you can explain what is the fog beforehand. You know, like before starting, there's a fog, cannot know everything. These are all things that you can use to explain to C-level, but also people in your team, why this long-term planning doesn't work. And as well, um, I'm working on open sourcing a friction game with the cats that you saw, right? So that you can actually do this game so that you can explain like, hey, what it, what we're doing, is that complex or is it complicated? How do we know that? Um, and I think that's the way to go because the, people need to understand what's at the bottom of this and I can tell you one thing, many people in the sea level, they are frustrated with the roadmap not being delivered on time. But what they actually believe is it's the fault of the people. You know what I mean? Very often, like we, if we had sufficient expertise, we knew, really knew what, then we would deliver on time and that's flawed. And uh, yeah, that's how I would address it. Thank you, Nora. Hey, what's your take on estimation? Yeah, so 
I know there's a whole no estimates camp. I'm not in that camp uh, because I've worked with estimates, without estimates. And I think all the conversations that happen before an estimate still need to happen when you don't do estimates. They are all the same conversations to reach common understanding. And then at the end of the day, you put a card down, right, with a number, but the number doesn't really matter that much. And then you you decide, okay, is it is it too big or do we need to size smaller? Are there differences? That's not what takes the most time. And then when you do no estimates, then you're kind of like slicing it small, but it's still an estimate. It's a, does it fit in the sprint one or zero? <laughs> That's it. So I don't think there's big of a difference. So I don't also don't honestly get what all the fuss is about. So yes, you always should slice small, whether you do estimates or not. And uh, yeah, um, all the steps are still the same. So there's only less room for abuse. Yes, but if you have good stakeholder management skills, then there won't be this abuse uh, with or without estimates. Okay. Have you explained the exercise for business value in your book? I don't think so. Well, okay. That was a fast one. Okay. Yeah, because so, I re- you know it, right? You, you know your book. Uh, and I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I, mean, I do have a different story in the book where I talk about this. And you might remember Stefan. It's kind of like the story where I was a child at the beach, but I'm not going to go into it. But there's a <laughs> story which explains it beautifully, in my opinion, because I was a kid. <laughs> Uh, and uh, basically, well, I'll, I'll tell it very shortly. So as a kid, I went to the beach and um, my parents, they would actually pay for drinks and pay for food. And it was super expensive. And I was like, I don't know, 10 or something. My eyes were really big, like, whoa, they're paying so much money. Well, there was a supermarket around, right? 10 minutes to the supermarket. And I was like, my parents are fools. Like, why are they, why are they not going to the supermarket? But now I'm a parent and I'm like, they were super smart. They were paying to spend more time with the kid at the beach. I would do the same. Like, <laughs> so this would be the same thing, but the perspective on value is very different. Only thing that's changed is my age. And last question, and we have four minutes left. Optional. I'm interested. Do you want to speak about the reason you wanted to write this book? What was your focus? Yeah. Well. Um, I'm also curious for your answer on this one, Stefan, because maybe it's the same, maybe it's very different. But for me, the reason for writing this book is because this topic grabbed me. So I also get a lot of questions like, are you going to write another book? Um, and I'm, at the moment, the answer is, I don't know, because I'm just waiting till something grabs me where I'm like, oh yeah, I really have something to say. So at the moment, I'm just reading, reading, reading. And if something grabs me, I will take the opportunity. And if it doesn't, then this is my last book. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Stefan? I think it was a selfish reason to a certain extent because I had a sort of ebook available of the same topic anyway to download. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I learned by explaining things to other people and yeah. by writing things down. So uh, writing a book about it seemed to be a good idea. <laughs> uh, never wrote a book before, and so I thought, well, how hard can this be? <laughs> so it's, yeah, and, and it's so, not hard, right? <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Totally simple. I mean, I just had to rewrite two thirds of the book. You know, so, um, yeah, but it was a was a fun exercise. Um, will there be a second one? I have no clue. Absolutely. I mean, there must be something I'm I'm really curious about, and I would like to explore more. I need to learn more about. Um, so I like this inversion principle. You know, yeah. I, I shamelessly copied that from Charlie Munger, and uh, it, it really helps. Like, so I like to uh, switch things. Uh, uh, upside down to get a different perspective. A yeah. big fan of pre-mortems and tris and uh, what comes to mind. Right? So um, in that respect, it was a good exercise. Nice. Okay. Martin, this was exciting, awesome. I'm totally happy that you managed to get here despite your kids are uh, ready for bed. Um, I really, really appreciate that. And uh, I hope we can repeat this next year if you like yeah. to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And um, to all the rest of you, enjoy the holiday season. And uh, I hope that uh, we will all meet again next year, sound and safe. <laughs>